For we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have come. But condense, if you will, the 50,000 years of man's recorded history in a time span of but a half a century. Stated in these terms, we know very little about the first 40 years, except at the end of them, advanced men had learned to use the skins of animals to cover them. Then about 10 years ago, under this standard, man emerged from his caves to construct other kinds of shelter. Only five years ago, man learned to write and use a cart with wheels. Christianity began less than two years ago. The printing press came this year. And then less than two months ago, during this whole 50 year span of human history, the steam engine provided a new source of power. Newton explored the meaning of gravity. Last month, electric lights and telephones and automobiles airplanes became available. Only last week, we developed penicillin and television and nuclear power. And now, if America's new spacecraft succeeds in reaching Venus, we will have literally reached the stars before midnight tonight. This is a breathtaking pace. And such a pace cannot help but create new ills we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Between the years 1968 and 1972, America launched nine human missions to the moon, six of which successfully touched down, allowing 12 men to walk on the lunar surface. For the first time in human history, humans had left the Earth. very reliable rockets that went a long way. <laughs> oh, I believe that was Saturn. I don't know. Ones with big engines on them, I suppose. I'm not sure. I really don't know. They probably had Toyota Hilux motors for all I know. I don't really know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, the Apollo missions used a Saturn V rocket. They were the largest at the time, uh, and the, basically they said they were sitting on top of a huge bomb. So they were massive. Now, if they didn't work, they would have gone cooked. But uh, being the biggest at the time, that did give them the kick to get up to 25,000 kilometers per hour, which is 25 times the speed of a bullet to break the Earth's atmosphere. Once they once they break the Earth's atmosphere, they are ready to keep going. So they were pretty big. Okay, so the, it had three stages. The first stage had five, Saturn V, I think were the name of the motors on the first stage. There's actually one still in existence that's down in Australia, which is down at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. Um, if you go under the bell, the bell is about four meters wide. It was used for test firing only. Other stages, I'm not sure the names of them. The second stage had five engines smaller and the third stage had one engine, if I remember right. 
Um, the first stage used kerosene and liquid oxygen. Uh, the other stages I'm not 100% sure on uh, for, the, for what they were using. But certainly, um, the, the pumps for the thing was actually, they were jet turbines that were running the pumps. The pumps themselves, the exhaust that came out of them, shot about 20 metres. So yeah, that was just the pump to pump the liquid into the motor. Uh, that would be the Saturn V, and I was actually around in 1969, I was about six years old then, and that's when man first went on the moon. So um, I'm familiar with the uh, Saturn V and also they had a display in the museum in Brisbane with the uh, Apollo missions. That's the Earth from space, isn't it? Um, something that they found on the moon when they landed there. Some special geographical type of landform or... Blue marble is a photograph of the Earth from space, I think. A blue marble? Well, a blue marble, as I know a blue marble, is in fact a marble that is blue, as opposed to a marble that is maybe green, or those big shiny ones that are like Tom Bowler's. I don't know if he's ever played marbles, but yeah, if someone said to me what a blue marble was, it's a blue marble about, I don't know, the size of a five cent coin, but obviously a sphere in shape. Turn around to your right, you I don't want to go into the sun if I can A blue marble was a picture of Earth taken from the moon. The blue marble, now when the, the uh, astronauts are on the moon for the first time, they're able to look back to Earth and see Earth rise like we normally watch the sun rise, uh, the moon rise. And when they look back, they can see the photo is of Earth rising and it looks like a blue marble. You've got water there and a little swirls of the clouds, a little bit of greenery for the Earth. So it, it's been nicknamed the blue marble. So Earth is a blue marble. The blue marble is the Earth. Um, when they were looking at the Earth from when they were going up to the moon, the first, few, the first, uh, well, Apollo 10 was probably the one I'm thinking of. But as they actually went to the moon, detached the whole thing, they flew down towards the moon surface and then back up again. They didn't land. But the, pre, the missions before Apollo 11 were actually designed to test the whole thing. And they were going around and one thing they took photos of was the Earth rise over the moon instead of the moon rise over the Earth. And they called it the Blue Marble. There's also... Um, if I remember right, Carl Sagan, no, he called it the blue, the pale blue dot. That's right, that um, was from a photo from Voyager when it was out near Jupiter. Um, I think it's uh, looking at Earth from space because it's just got a real blue colour in the atmosphere. Eat some real food and sleep. Um, sleeping and partying with their families, getting lots of hugs and probably some gifts. They spent it in biological quarantine. I don't know, they probably had a bit of relaxed time and had a few quiet drinks and played Monopoly, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that one either. Um, I don't know, maybe had massages, ate a bit of um, junk food, I'm not sure. Shining velocity on two shoots is 28 feet per second, or 32 feet per second versus 28 feet on three shoots. I think they were in biological quarantine. Well, this is an interesting question because when they left Earth, uh, they went straight from USA straight up, straight up to the moon, up to the moon, fly around for a little bit, and come back. And then they splashed down, they splashed down international waters. Now, what they don't, weren't too sure is, were they going to pick up a biological hazard? Were they going to be COVID-19 locked in quarantine? Well, in fact, they were locked in quarantine because we weren't too sure what was happening. So they were locked in quarantine, picked up from the boat onto a naval vessel, straight away sealed up in, 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 in the quarantine. They waved to their family through the window in quarantine. They were a biological quarantine lockdown hazard. And then, they got out of that, they had to have their passport stamped for re-entry back to America. And also the stuff they brought back with them could have been a hazard as well. So they tested it all to make sure that the moon rocks were perfectly fine. And as far as we know, they're pretty well. They didn't spend that much time up there, so they would have been in quarantine for a start. All astronauts uh, even now go through a quarantine stage when they come back, just in case there's a 
bad virus we don't know about lurking on the moon or wherever it might be. So as far as I know, it would have been quarantine, being debriefed, would be my guess, because they were airline, uh, Air Force people. Okay, they would have been in quarantine for a period of time, uh, just in case they picked up anything that's biological from another planet. Now, the Apollo missions to the moon have totaled 12 in total. So that's not too many. There's only 12 people in the world who can say they've been onto the surface of the moon. Now, of that 12, there's no females, which is a bit, a bit unfortunate. And the other thing that's really a trivial question is, what do they all have in common? Each one of those astronauts was a, was a little cub scout at one stage of their life. So they've all had the same proportions to get into the spacesuits. So only 12 in total have been to the moon. That's a very small club. For each Apollo mission that got to the moon, there were two crew members that landed. So you had Apollo 11, 12, 13 didn't land, 14, 15, 16, 17. So that gives me 12, I think. On January 27, 1967, tragedy struck on the launch pad at Cape Kennedy during a pre-flight test for the Apollo 204. The mission was to be the first crewed flight of Apollo and was scheduled to launch February 21st, 1967. Astronauts Virgil Grissom, Edward White and Roger Chathe lost their lives when a fire swept through the command module. The next five missions were test flights due to the Apollo 1 tragedy. They needed extensive testing on their designs before attempting another manned mission. Apollo 7 successfully demonstrated the command and service module with the crew performance and featured the first American live broadcast from space. Apollo 8 was the first crewed spacecraft to successfully orbit the moon and return to Earth. The Apollo 8 crew were also the first to witness and photograph an Earth rise. Apollo 9 was the first crewed spaceflight with the lunar module. The crew tested various maneuvers with the lunar module in preparation for the moon landing. The Apollo 10 mission was the first flight of a complete crewed Apollo spacecraft to operate around the moon. It included all aspects of a lunar landing except for the landing. On July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 crew successfully completed the national goal set by President John F. Kennedy, eight years prior to perform a crewed lunar landing and return to Earth. The second Apollo crew built on the work of the first. In addition to continuing Apollo's lunar exploration tasks, they deployed experiments and recovered portions of a lander that had been on the moon for two years. Apollo 13 was to be the third lunar landing attempt, but the mission was aborted after a rupture of the service module oxygen tank. The crew was rescued, resulting in a successful failure. Apollo 14 was the eighth crewed Apollo mission and the third to land on the moon. During their two moonwalks, the crew ran science experiments and collected 94 pounds of rock and soil. Apollo 15 was the first of the Apollo missions capable of a longer stay time on the moon and greater surface mobility. The crew was the first to use the lunar roving vehicle. During the Apollo 16 mission, the crew drove more than 16 miles over three moonwalks on the lunar roving vehicle and collected 209 pounds of samples. Apollo 17 was the last mission in which humans traveled to the moon. It was distinguished by extended hardware capability, larger scientific payload capacity, and the use of the battery-powered lunar vehicle. We were given the opportunity to have our name submitted to the Parker Solar Probe. So the Parker Solar Probe was um, sent from Earth and it's going to be doing some orbits and then ultimately crashing into the surface of the Sun, giving um, humanity its first ever close-up view of the star. Um, as part of that we got these little certificates. So pretty much there is a USB that's inside the solar probe and it contains the names of all different people from all over the world that were lucky enough to have their name put in. Oh, the love.
to your heart.